When it comes to mental health, there are still harmful attitudes and misunderstandings surrounding the illness, which often makes it harder for people to reach out for help. Can you talk to us about the psychology of not wanting to get psychological help and what can we do to help people who may be struggling uh, with the pandemic? So there's a huge misconcept of a, a misunderstanding of what emotional strength is. We tend to assume as a society that emotional strength is what we see, I mean, truly in, in action heroes in Hollywood movies. And let's just take as an example, um, Liam Neeson in the movie Taken, right? So uh, this is an ex-operative. And by the way, I'm not, this is not a spoiler. The movie's called Taken. You know, his daughter's going to get... Sort of like the Titanic. Yeah, you know, you, you know what's happening. So, you know, he has a daughter. She's a teenage daughter. She gets abducted by sex traffickers. And he gets on the phone in this very stoic way. Now, he just heard his daughter live screaming as she's taken away by sex traffickers. Who knows what's going on in the other room? And the bad guy takes the phone and Liam Neeson says completely, you know, with no emotion, you know, I have a particular set of skills and kind of threatens him. And that became, I mean, one of his skills is not uh, having access to his emotions because there is, and, but that's what we think emotional strength is, the absence of an emotional reaction. That's not emotionally strong at all. And it's also not very human at all. Emotional strength is having access to your emotions, managing them, experiencing them, and bouncing back from them. We don't seem to understand that. So if you express emotional distress, when emotionally distressing things are happening, you might be looked at like, well, you know, you're, you're weak or you're, you're crumbling. You know, this term, they broke down and cried, pisses me off because crying is not a sign of breakdown. It's a sign of you know, things coming out of your eye. But I've seen people in a fist fight that tears come down. I've seen athletes, you know, in such pain that tears are coming down, but they're completing the race. It's very brave of them. They're not, and then you hear the commentators, oh, they're breaking down. They're still running. So I don't see how that when my car breaks down, I can't drive it. They're still running. So just this misconcept of any expression of emotion is a sign of weakness is what prevents people from having the discussion and from admitting that they're in distress. And we need to re-educate people about what emotional strength is. Emotional strength is not your reaction in the moment to something that happens. That's a physiological set point of just how your body responds. Emotional strength is how quickly you bounce back. If two people fail at something that's crucial to them and one of them breaks into tears and the other one is stoic, but the next day the one who cried starts up the project again and the one who was stoic never does because they're so demoralized, who is stronger? It's the one that cried because it doesn't tell anything about their psychology and about their strength. So we have this very surface understanding of what strength and resilience is which is fundamentally incorrect and makes us judge people erroneously all the time. What's well, even, you, you make the distinction, uh, you know, like it, people say, shake it off, you know, you're feeling down, but they would never tell you that if you broke your leg, you know, I mean, and, and it's, a, it's a great distinction that you make, but it's, it's a society built that way for years. I mean, the thought of my parents going to therapy, I mean, they just never would. I mean, it just would, it, somehow they would sense that that was a failure in them. How do we turn the page on that? Because it's still there, isn't it? So, for example, let's go back to the Taken movie. If Liam Neeson had delivered that line with a tear running down his cheek and his lip trembling, to me he would have seemed way more heroic um, rather than not. Um, when the Blitz was going on during World War II, then stay calm and carry on was actually good advice because when bombs are being dropped on you, literally, asking yourself, well, how do I feel? about the bombs being dropped on me is not terribly useful. It doesn't really matter how you feel. Run to the shelter. That's just, you know, it's a survival imperative and, and now our needs are about safety. But we're not in the blitz. And even with a pandemic, we're in a different level of society. Our emotional health, our emotional health matters. And we can actually do something about it. But we have to accept that we have to really be able to look at how are we feeling? How are we doing? Do I need to do something um, about that. And unless we can start depicting strong people as people who actually have a range of emotions and who can express emotional distress when they have it, and that doesn't diminish, doesn't take away from how 
admirable they might be, how strong they might be, how resilient they might be, how successful they might be, um, then we're not going to change perceptions because people are still going to worry that if you cried, it means you're weak. When that's absolutely not true. It just means you're physiologically set to respond in that way. The weakness comes from how are you responding behaviorally? What are you doing in your head? What happens the next day? The social and economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic are harming mental health and well-being. Some researchers believe by 2029, as many as 75,000 more people will die in the U.S. from suicide and the misuse of alcohol or drugs. Experts believe now is the time for policymakers to act. Let me ask you about uh, you know, travel, something that you did a lot of prior to uh, COVID arriving, but you're getting a chance to get out and travel again. And you were telling me prior to the interview that uh, one of your most interesting trips just occurred. Talk to us about that. Um, I was invited to come to 10 Downing Street, the um, seat of power in the UK where the Prime Minister lives. It's like the White House in the UK to speak to policymakers about what policies they should implement for mental health that would be helpful to the citizens in the UK. And it was, first of all, for, as a psychologist, what a joy that people are even asking that question. Like, oh, policies for mental health. It's not a question you hear often. Um, and so the fact that they were interested in that was, was very exciting. But certainly now, post-COVID, there's a huge need for mental health policies on a national scale. I mean, truly every country should be doing this. But the other issue there is that our psychological sophistication is lagging a hundred years behind our sophistication when it comes to our physical health. That was that favoritism that we referenced earlier, that we really favor the physical over the emotional and the psychological. And so people literally do not know basics about emotional hygiene. You know, we brush your teeth twice a day and you know if you have a sprain, you should ice pack it and maybe if you have a cut you should cover it with a bandage and kids know at young ages how to take care of physical ailments. We have no such knowledge on the grand scale of how to do that psychologically when the information is actually, it exists. People like me talk about it but the public at large doesn't know it. They need to know it and they need to know it now more than ever. So it was a true pleasure for me and I was very excited that the British government was so much on the ball that they were like, yeah, let's actually pay this a lot of attention right now because we see the need. You would have to be blind to not see the need. I don't know who doesn't see the need for that. And if you just think that pandemic will be over and that will be over, no, it won't. Because psychological damage, unfortunately, our minds tend to take us down the wrong paths. And so we don't naturally fix it. A bone, once it's set, will heal naturally. An emotional wound might not and probably will not unless it's addressed in some kind of way. So people need those tools. They need the basic knowledge and information. And there's an opportunity now that people are so interested in emotional health because they're looking around and seeing like, I guess it's a thing. Uh, yes, it's a thing. That, that there's an opportunity now to get people more educated and to find some kind of central way to disseminate information. And what I said to them was, you're just spending eight months creating infrastructure to cre shoot out information to inform your citizenship of vital things every country did use that infrastructure to give them this information now to kind of move us past into healing because we'll need it on, at scale and we don't have it at scale. My daughter, as I mentioned, lives in the UK. Uh, trying to get a therapist through NHS though is, is a nightmare. I mean, uh, and you mentioned it yourself. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that need help. There aren't enough of you. Uh, so when they talk to you about what, what are some policy objectives we should have is that part of the equation? I mean, what are some of the suggestions you make? So, for example, you might notice if you go to your app store um, that you have a ton of apps that are supposed to be helpful with anxiety. Some of them are for mindfulness. Some of them are supposed to help you with depression. Some are supposed to help you with connecting to other people. You know, like there's one company called Circles, which has micro-targeted support groups. And so if you are bereaved in this certain way and you want to talk to other people who are bereaved because you lost your kid as an adult to cancer, et cetera, et cetera, you can find parents of that kind that you can connect to. A lot of companies are doing that privately, but there needs to be a place to do it publicly. The advantage of psychological interventions is that you can truly deliver them with basically 
short videos, a series of short videos, worksheets, and some bots for personalization. And that can be a powerful intervention. It doesn't require heavy machinery like an MRI. It doesn't require six years of R&D of uh, development. It doesn't require individual administration by shots in arms. You can scale psychological interventions and bring them to the public and make the public aware of them. One example, we know a ton about parenting. There, you know, parents always say, well, it's not as if the kid came with a manual. Why not? We know enough. We don't know everything for sure, but there is very clear science on a lot of it that we could give every new parent here are some instructional videos, some worksheets, some this, some if then, then that, that would be so helpful for parents who don't know how to deal with tantrums, who don't know how to set limits, who don't know how to do emotional coaching, who don't know really how to respond to their children. We could tell people that we're not doing it and I don't understand why, because it's, it's a matter of will. It's, it's so cheap to do compared to any other kind of intervention that requires the years of the R&D and the heavy machinery. You can scale it. The ROI would be incredible. You just need governments, and that's why I was so pleased with the UK. I would love it if the US did it. I would love it if any government did it. You need governments to figure out, like, maybe we need to do something here because we can help our populace in huge ways and reduce medical bills and re increase productivity. It have huge impacts. No one's doing it yet. I, I hope the UK will continue and do it. Resilience is the process of finding healthy ways to adapt and cope with adversity and distress. Mental health experts believe building resilience can be key to helping us get through the coronavirus crisis and its aftermath. I have a friend of mine who says all bad things are good things in disguise and you just have to kind of work your way through it and, and uh, gets to another piece, which is resiliency. I mean, um, working your way through these uh, in, in many ways, that's the payoff, is that we become stronger in the broken places, as Ernest Hemingway said. Right. However, um, let me give you this example. Um, let's look at two people. One of them, both of them had a very hard time. One of them at the end of this pandemic, whenever that will be, um, will say, um, wow, that really sucked. It was very, very, very difficult. I went through such a hard time. It was terrible, period. The other will say, wow, that really sucked. I had such a hard time. I went through such a terrible period, but I got through it. Good for me. One is going to build resilience, the other isn't. Because resilience is about acknowledging your strengths, recognizing your strengths when you have them, as well as recognizing your weakness, because then you need to do something about it, or you need to tend to it in some kind of way. So it's about having the finger on your emotional pulse. And we've all been through something. We should theoretically all build resilience from this experience, but only if we know how. It's not enough to survive it. If your mindset doesn't wrap around the fact that you did and recognize how you did and what strengths you brought to the force, what coping mechanisms you relied on that were successful to you, what were the hard moments that were dark for you and how you managed to get through them, recognizing that hardship and that you got through it is what will build resilience. Wanting to shrug it off and like, okay, now it's done, won't. And even that nuance in terms of resilience building is something people don't know. And a lot of people are gonna miss the opportunity to really strengthen themselves, feel good about themselves, feel very strong in terms of going forward, because hopefully it'll be a while before another one of these comes along. And they're gonna miss that boat because they're not taking the time to introspect, to reflect, to acknowledge the hardship first, and then to acknowledge their ability to get through the hardship second. And that is key for building resilience. Being here at the epicenter of something as tragic and horrible as 9-11, and then being here for COVID and all the death and the despair, and being in your job, uh, what were the similarities you saw? And, and having that experience, I guess it's a twofold question, having the experience of 9-11, did that help steal yourself in preparation for what you were gonna get with the coronavirus in terms of patients and some of the concerns that they were gonna? Um, yes, I mean, because the, there's, there's overlap um, there. The difference was that was a discrete event that happened in one day versus one that went on and on and on and is still going on for many, many months um, at a stretch. So there's a little bit difference in terms of a, you know, a discrete event versus an on, ongoing one. But in New York, people came together both during 9-11 and during COVID, there was a sense of camaraderie. I mean, I, this is New York. I didn't experience other cities, other towns. I don't know how it was there. 
But here there was this sense of neighbor helping neighbor. During 9-11, there was a real sense of camaraderie. People on the streets were friendly. People were running around with pictures of their loved ones who were missing and they thought maybe they were in the hospital in the days and they didn't know. And you were always trying to help them and there was this real wish to try and, and do something and to try and, you know, come together as a community. I saw that in 9-11 and I'm, at least in New York, you know, there was a strong sense of that, um, certainly at the beginning uh, here. And so that was, that was a positive aspect of it. But again, some people, I had one patient who got uh, badly injured and they came into the session when they were out of the hospital and they said this, um, I got badly injured, I was in the hospital for two weeks, I don't want to talk about it. Now as a therapist, most people would assume that I should say, but you need to talk about it. That's not what the research says. What the research says is that there are two kinds of reactions to these things. Some people really need to talk and really need to express and if they don't have the ability to do that or have an ear to listen to it, they're going to be in distress. Some people need to compartmentalize and move on and they can do that successfully. And if they're caused, if they're meant, if they're made to go back and relive and process because that's the healthy thing, that will traumatize them when they weren't traumatized before. And I knew the research and so I was able to say, I will respect that. I reserve the right as we go forward in the weeks to see if that is not something that is working well for you to revisit this issue. But I will respect that for now. And indeed that person, he was a very stoic person. He was able to kind of compartmentalize well. He did get through it without dwelling. There were other people who were the opposite. They needed to talk about it all the time. I lost one patient in one of the planes. The, 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 and, you know, and so the, there was things that were happening that you really saw the difference in how we as people respond to these kinds of huge crises and how different our responses can be and how we each need to know what's better for us because it's not a one-size-fits-all in psychology. That's why psychologists are so annoying when you ask them a question. They often say, well, it depends. Because it depends a lot of the time on who you are, on what your preferences are, on what your psychological makeup is. As many companies decide if it's safe to reopen their offices, both businesses and employees are learning how to adjust to a new normal. But there are ways to cope. We spend a lot of time talking about COVID. There will be a post-pandemic. People will have to go back to work. There's going to be some anxiety and stress there. What's your advice? I think people, after training themselves to literally be anxious about being outside or being in public transportation, certainly being in small conference rooms, there's going to be anxiety, there's going to be discomfort. And the way you deal with that is you do it gradually. If you need to take the subway one day for a stop and then to get off if you're feeling uncomfortable, to train yourself before you actually have to get back to the office, do that. If you're concerned about it, reach out to a co-worker who might be feeling the same way because having a friend there that can help you through it or who is experiencing the same problem and you can help each other through it will also be helpful. i also spoken to a lot of CEOs and managers who know this is an issue. That's why you have the hybrid model in a lot of places. Let's do that gradually a couple of days at a time. So there is an openness to discuss this and to try and problem solve together in many companies. So keep your temperature, like take the temperature of how you're doing emotionally and if you need to address something, if you need to take it slower, either do that if you can or speak up and find ways to work with it within your team, within the company that you're at. Through his public appearances, books, podcasts and one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions, Guy believes he can best help those who are struggling with mental health problems. Can you imagine what the world would be like if everyone was psychologically healthier? If there were less loneliness and less depression? You know, I was, I was watching your TED Talks today and one of the things that went through my mind was like, geez, this must be really gratifying for you to know that you've touched so many people around the world who just had maybe an extra 15 minutes who could watch one of your talks. And, and it, it has this impact. It's very, very gratifying because I spent the first 15 years of my career doing this one-on-one. -on -one. Two on one if it's a couple, three, four if it's a family, but mostly one on one. And suddenly I can scale. Suddenly, you know, I put a talk out five years ago, then another one a few years ago, another one. And I'm getting constant emails, messages, um, you know, Instagram messages, Twitter, social media messages, texts from people saying, this truly, truly 
help me. And people don't just say this truly help me, they tell me their story and tell me how it helped them. I try to respond to as many of those as I can. There's sometimes it gets very, there's just too many and there's only so much me and my assistants can, can do. But, but I, I'm very, very touched by it. It's very, very gratifying. I'm a mission-driven purpose. I, came, I went into this field because I wanted to help people to be able to have that platform. I'm so grateful for Ted for giving me that platform because they, they truly allowed me to help so many people with that one talk or that other talk or the other. And, and what a privilege. And I'm, I'm grateful for that all the time. I, I practice gratitude exercises every day. I believe in them very strongly. The science is very strong when it comes to gratitude exercises. It's one of the things that I often express in my gratitude exercises that how fortunate I am to have a platform where I get to help more than just the handful of people that I could be helping otherwise. How privileged that feels for me and how gratifying it is. I'm very grateful for it. I'm very grateful for the people who write and take the time to express that to me because it's very, very meaningful. Well, you took us to a lot of right places, Sky. Thanks so much. Thank you. It was great.